Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe, now completing week 10 and hopefully the last week of my flu. On this edition, Stuart McPherson explores the natural world one mountain at a time. But first up, here's the news. <laughs> Vacuum tunes. Forget chip tunes from the old days of 8-bit computer chips. Professor Jack Copeland and composer Jason Long from the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, have restored a 1951 acetate disc recording of music generated by the vacuum tube computer used by Alan Turing himself. The Colossus Mark II, designed to break German codes in World War II. The Manchester computer had a special instruction that caused the loudspeaker, which Turing called the hooter, to emit a short pulse of sound, lasting a tiny fraction of a second. Executing the instruction over and over resulted in a click being produced on every fourth tick of the computer's internal clock. Tick, 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 click. Tick, 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 click. Repeating the instruction enough times caused the human ear not to hear discrete clicks, but a steady note. In fact, the note C6, two octaves above middle C. Turing realised that if the hoot instruction were repeated, not just over and over again but in different patterns, then the ear would hear different musical notes. In this way, he was able to generate C5, an octave above middle C, F4, four notes above the middle C, and so on. Turing used these notes to give audible signals about what was happening in the computer while the program was running. One note for job finished, others for digits overflowing in memory, error when transferring data from the magnetic drum, and so on. In 1951, a schoolteacher friend of Turing's named Christopher Strachey got hold of a copy of Turing's Programmer's Handbook for Manchester Electronic Computer Mark II. Strachey turned up at Turing's Manchester lab with what was at the time the longest computer program ever to be attempted. Turing let him stay in the lab overnight to enter the program. In the morning, Strachey was able to make the computer play the British national anthem, God Save the King, to which Turing is reported to have said, Good show. A few weeks later, Strachey was offered a programming job at Turing's Computing Machine Laboratory and entered a lifetime career as a computer scientist. Later that year, a BBC outside broadcast unit in Manchester used a mobile acetate disc cutter to record three melodies played by the Colossus Mark II. The machine played God Save the King, Bar Bar Black Sheep, and Glenn Miller's In the Mood. The researchers found that the Colossus Mark II had a limited range of frequencies it could generate. For example, the true pitch of G3 is 196 Hz, but the closest frequency that the Mark II could generate was well off the note, at 198.41 Hz. These limits helped them realise that some of the sounds that could be heard on the record were physically impossible for the Mark II to play. The 12-inch disc, which was labelled to be played at 78 revolutions per minute, had actually been recorded at a higher speed, and this had shifted the frequencies when it was played at 78 RPM. They were able to calculate the correct playing speed of the disc, clean up external noise, and make up for distortions caused by a wobble in the disc while it was recording. So here at last is the restored version of the 1951 recording of the world-changing Colossus Mark II computer, retired from breaking German codes in World War II to play music for the BBC. Alright, uh, hang on again. The machine's not enjoying this. It's gone on strike a bit. Let me know when you're... I should lift Jim, I think.
lift him. Another tune coming up. Another one coming up. Wrong cutting. <laughs> <laughs> the machine's obviously not in the mood. <laughs> I left him. The work of Alan Turing's computing machine laboratory was kept secret after the end of World War II until the 1970s. So it's strange that the BBC made this recording in 1951. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Stuart McPherson is a naturalist, writer and a filmmaker. He's climbed 300 mountains to research 25 books on carnivorous plants. I met up with Stuart in a park by the water in Piermont and began by asking him where did he start. My story is about a a 10-year story. I set out always to get into wildlife films and make documentaries looking at natural history. I I started when I was a teenager writing my first book. I I was ill one summer and had to be in hospital for a few months one summer. So I started writing my first book then. I was really lucky to get some scholarships to go to the States uh, while I was a student, this is about 12 years ago, and um, organized a, a series of epic helicopter expeditions to some really remote mountains in, in Venezuela and um, I was looking at carnivorous plants, these pitcher plants of the Americas. There was one group in particular that were very little known at the time, they're called Heliumphora. So I I helicoptered to lots of of these huge lost world mountains, these Tepui or or Tepui mountains, and wrote up my first book while I was a student. And amazingly, I managed to, to get it published. Most of the publishers said no and told me to get lost. But one of them actually uh, did, did accept it to be published. And it was published as a book, which did really, really quite well in the end. What's the book called? Uh, that was a book called Pitcher Plants of the Americas. It looks at all of the different groups of carnivorous pitcher plants found in North America and South America. Anyway, like I said, I wanted to get into wildlife films. That was always my, my goal. So um, during university, I... I while I finished my university degree, I, I decided to 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 get get this moving. Um, so as soon as I graduated, I took out a loan, set up a company, and started an ambitious plan to write 25 more books on, particularly on carnivorous plants, but also some other subjects, but particularly carnivorous plants, just because there was a really open niche about looking at them in the wild. Thousands of people grew them, and there'd been lots of wonderful books about how to grow them but relatively little about how they all grow in the wild, what they look like, what animals they capture and kill. They're, they're adaptations and stuff in the wild. So I set out for a 10-year project to, to climb about 300 mountains to try and find well, hundreds of these carnivorous plants to photograph and document. And in some cases, some of them honestly had never been even seen since they were discovered, in some cases, 100 or more years ago. 300 mountains, that's quite a few. Yeah, it was actually. <laughs> I mean, they they were they range in difficult. I mean, some of them were literally just day trips, just a few hours walking up and down. Others involved, for example, I can think of one in Kalimantan, where I wanted to rediscover with with a friend, Charles Clark. We, we wanted to rediscover a, a lost species called Nepenthes pilosa, and that uh, that trip, that single trip for one spe- lost species, took yeah, it was about. 12, 13 days in the end, just for that one mountain. So they really varied a lot in difficulty. But in that mix, there was about 50 that there were no records of any botanists going up before. And um, with different friends, I was, I was lucky to go and explore those those ones and find about 30 new taxa of, of um, carnivorous plants, including quite a few new species, including one of the, the biggest carnivorous pitcher plants known, 
which, um, which we in the end decided to name uh, Nepenthes Atomborei. That was with Alistair Robinson and Volker Heinrich, two, two friends, and we, we found it on a really remote mountain in, in Palamo, Palawan in the Philippines. How big are the traps? Oh, <laughs> well, in that case, the traps of Nepenthes Atomborei, yeah, they're something like, well, they're certainly over 30 centimetres tall. I've been lucky to go back to that mountain a couple of times since, and we actually filmed in it bodies of dead shrews. Uh, some of these plants can catch animals as big as rats, and in that particular case, it really is one of the biggest pitcher plants known uh, so far. And yeah, in that case, there really were dead shrews in some of the traps, which um, which is kind of crazy. Uh, the plant itself produces leaves that, in circumference, you know, the whole rosette is something like maybe one meter, one one meter twenty centimeters, something like that across. And then the pitchers develop on tendrils from the ends of the leaves, and yeah, certainly thirty or so centimeters easily probably more I, I can't remember exactly but yeah it's a very very impressive plant is it in cultivation now yes it is we actually we, it, at that time it wasn't in any protected area and the best way we could protect it uh, because poaching has threatened many of these rare nepenthes that command hundreds and even thousands of dollars in price the best way we could conserve it is just collect some seeds and send it totally free to loads of people particularly the big tissue culture nurseries and they mass producing it, selling it for very little money, which quashes the demand for poaching. And that's the best thing you can do to safeguard some of these really rare Nepenthes. There are other species that that didn't happen, that are, that are basically extinct already, such as Nepenthes clipiata or Nepenthes rigidifolia. So in this case, yeah, we, we actually, we wanted to help get it into people's hands to, to totally quash any demand for poaching and it, it is controversial because some people say well no you shouldn't ever collect any seeds or anything and that I understand that point however in the reality of, of the circumstances where yeah unfortunately it's an, it's an area in Palawan which has very low income per, per capita the fact that these plants certainly had we not have distributed the seeds today would be worth hundreds if not thousands of dollars you could absolutely bet your boots they'd be would be being poached in huge numbers, like many of those other Nepenthes that are already virtually extinct in the wild. So yeah, to answer your question, it is in culture. They grow really slowly. So, you know, five-year-old seedlings are still only, you know, maybe 10 centimetres across. So it'll probably be quite a while before they get to their full size. But yeah, lots of people around the world are growing it now, which is good. And is that the case for some of the other ones you found that are endangered? Well, yeah, I mean... Actually, this illustrates the point. I was very lucky to be part of naming a species called Nepenthes pitapangii, which, which we did the opposite of. We absolutely didn't collect any seeds of. And the type locality of that has been completely destroyed. Poachers have just simply gone in and ripped out all of them. There is one other site that was rediscovered separately more recently by some friends of mine where it does occur. So it's not extinct in the wild, but the original population that I was lucky to, to go and see what is now totally extinct. So yeah, and that's, that's from Sulawesi. And that's very sad because it's a very special plant. And yeah, the, the, the demand, the temptation, and I'm certainly in no way trying to put local blame on local people it's all people from all over the world especially Europe and, and North America as well so yeah the, absolutely in other in other cases yeah it, it's it's been a disaster and, and they've or even within the few years since they were discovered have been wiped out and so they're very vulnerable and if people want to cultivate plants without encouraging the poachers what do you recommend oh there's there's um thousands of ways you can do it I mean all of these plants now can be tissue cultured and that was the logic in distributing the seeds. All you need is one seed to germinate in, in vitro, in tissue culture, and you can generate infinite numbers quickly, cheaply, very, very cheaply and quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, lots of the big nurseries around the world for these, for these carnivorous plants, but equally any other group of plants, orchids, any others, they mass produce these plants. They can sell them for, in some cases, pennies or, or certainly a few dollars, you know, very, 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 very cheaply. And that's, of course, if you go into a garden centre, that's how most of those plants are mass-produced and, and, um, and created for retail. So with these kind of plants, yeah, there are many, many retailers around the world that produce these sustainably. And equally, less, less technologically advanced methods. I mean, you don't need to tissue culture plants in that way. You can literally take cuttings. And many of these Nepenthes, yeah, not all of them, but many of them can be produced 
pretty easily through cuttings or even seeding culture. So yeah, by no means do you have to impact wild populations in order to grow them. Absolutely the opposite. You can grow them without any impact whatsoever and they're wonderful plants to grow. So if people are looking at buying plants online, how can they make sure they're buying them from tissue culture generated ones and not from poached ones? Well, that's a good point. It's a very tricky game. If you look on eBay, you will see loads of plants that have clearly been ripped out of the wild and it's really depressing and a conservationist nightmare. But equally, there are lots of very, very reputable companies that, that sell only tissue cultured plants. For example, here in Australia, there's uh, Captive Exotics, or Exotica plants, and, and, and several others, many, many others, or through the societies that, of course, have seed banks from seed produced in culture. Internationally, yeah, there's lots of nurseries for these carnivorous plants, like Wistaba or Borneo Exotics, or many, or Malaysiana, or many others, or California carnivores in the States. All of those absolutely never, ever, ever sell poached plants and are great sources you can buy from. Yeah, so, so they're really, really wonderful, really wonderful plants to cultivate. And you've been documenting your expeditions on video. Yes, just as I go along. I don't really know why, but ever since I started doing these trips, I always took a video camera with me. I've got literally hundreds, probably 400, 500 hours of footage just sitting on drives. And I've, I've edited or, or I've worked with editors to create a few very short expedition videos, like 20 minute, 30 minute ones. I think I've done about five or six of them now. Just for fun, really, just to show people what it's like. Because the funny thing is you can grow these plants in culture but have absolutely no clue what it's like to actually go and find them in the wild. A, for how much effort it takes to go and find them, but equally also seeing them in the wild, even in a video, just watching a video about them in the wild, can convey really useful information about how to grow them. You know, obviously, the best thing you can do in culture is to replicate the wild conditions, the conditions to which those plants, or, or, or indeed animals, are naturally evolved to, to survive amongst. So that's, yeah, the best way you can grow them. So, yeah, we kind of created lots of these little expedition videos to try and, yeah, show people those, those stories and share what it's like actually out in the world with them. So take us through, what's it like going on an expedition where you're going to some remote place to find out, well, either to see what plants are there or to see if the plants are still there? Well, it really depends. Sometimes it's incredibly easy, like in to these lost world, these giant tepuis or plateaus in Venezuela. Um, you can only go to most of them by helicopter. So to be honest with those ones, it's ridiculously easy. You just rock up at a helipad and jump in the helicopter and then 30 minutes or an hour later or whatever, you land and you step out and set up a camp and then start exploring. Uh, for other mountains, particularly in Southeast Asia, it's much more traditional. You know, I, I mean in a sense that you don't need helicopters, so you can do it in a much more traditional, traditional way, hiring guides and local porters. And, well, it depends completely on the mountain, but let's say it's one of the less well-explored ones. You generally would find hunters or resin collectors or, or rattan collectors or, or some kind of, of, of local expert with expertise knowledge of the area. It would be very easy to, to, to find that and of course a team of porters, and you just set out. For the really remote mountains where, which haven't been explored, that I've been fortunate to, to visit, we would follow the rivers always first. If there's no trails, we'd follow the rivers as far as they can go. When the rivers run out, we'd get onto the ridges, start following a ridge point up the ridge top, the, the, water, uh, the top of the watershed, up that, and that will all, almost always keep leading to ridges unless it gets to a cliff when it's just impassable. But unless there's something you know, catastrophic, which there's no way you'll be able to surmount or pass, it'll re le a ridge top will generally lead you to another ridge top. And if you just, just literally keep walking up, you will eventually get higher and higher and higher up towards the summit. And often there's a band of rattan or, or bamboo or something really dense that circles the upper slopes of the mountain that you'll have to machete through. And then finally you'll get, if the mountain's tall enough, finally you'll get to a beautiful cloud forest um, or heath forest or, you know, environment. And it's that environment which is really good for these carnivorous plants, generally. But yeah, so, so to be honest, but honestly, every single mountain is, is completely different, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a conservation effort in some arcs. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's very, very small at this stage, but... Even in my decade of travelling to see all these carnivorous pitcher plants and, and other kind of plants, lots of the species that I, I've been photographing 
have become extinct or virtually extinct in the wild. Extinct where, whereby there's so few left that there's no hope ever really in the future unless something is done. And um, the truth is this project is called Ark of Life. It's still absolutely small. I'm not trying to portray it as some big conservation. It's not. Um, but um, it's important nevertheless. Um, the idea is there's, there's four species of Nepenthes that are basically extinct or at least extinct in, a, in an evolutionary sense in the wild. Um, two in particular, Nepenthes rigidifolia, which is completely gone, as in there's not a single plant known at the type locality, the only population known. There's not a single plant left in the wild. So that is extinct in the wild. There might be other populations, but until those are found, we have to go on what we know, and it, it is gone. And then there's Nepenthes clipiata, which I went to actually visit a few weeks ago, and that occurred on a spectacular mountain called Mount Kalam. But that too is basically gone. After three days of searching, very intensive searching, we only found three mature plants, and they're very scattered. There's not a hope in hell that's a, sustain, a sustainable population. It's, it is gone in the wild as well, sadly. So this little project, Ark of Life, basically sets out to try and conserve these plants. What it does is it brings together the plants that are already in culture. Again, we don't in any way want to promote poaching, but in, although, although in those cases it's impossible to poach because they're basically gone already. But nevertheless, like we don't want to in any way promote or encourage any, any further poaching or of any plants. But in those cases, what we try and do is get those plants that are in culture right now. So at the moment, there's lots of these extinct in the wild plants floating around amongst collectors. It is true that many of those were, were probably obtained illegally or you know a seed that was collected or even plants that were collected and it is it is a controversial subject because yeah the reality is the plants that many of those collectors are growing now yeah are, are grey plants in that sense but the reality also is that they're extinct in the wild and they're now in culture if we do nothing at all those collectors will, will certainly you know lose interest or die or whatever in 50 years or more and those plants will be lost there's just no doubt about that looking 100 200 500 years into the future they're gone and those species are then extinct completely so to try and take a pragmatic view without in any way trying to promote poaching the idea is to collect those plants that are already in culture not any more and any from the wild but the ones that are already in culture to try and persuade the people that grow them to give cuttings or seeds or, or sell offshoots or, or, or even the actual plants or whatever, to, to bring them together in a central, organised, permanent collection. Because for these pitcher plants, they're single sex. So that means a plant, a particular plant, will only ever be male or female. So to have any kind of a viable population, you need multiple, as in lots of male and also lots of female strains. So just having one plant won't do because a any offspring, you know, of a normal plant that's by you know has both sex flowers, that 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 will be genetically identical. So it's useless as a long-term population. But but for these nepenthes, yeah, you need lots of males and lots of females to have any hope of having any viable population. So this little arc of life project that I've tried to set up, it, it basically sets out to get as many of these distinct lineages and strains as possible of these super rare highly endangered plants to maintain a permanent collection so that 100, 200, 300 years into the future, hopefully, the, the, the possibility, the hope of reintroducing them back into the, into the wild still exists. And the, the key point is that if we do nothing, it's over already. It's gone. If we maintain these collections, even though some of those plants in culture probably are originally poached decades ago, at least there's the hope that, that we can one day, or, or in future generations one day, could reintroduce them. So it's kind of trying to make the best of a bad situation. The project's really small. All it consists of is a collection at, at Leiden Botanic Gardens in, in Holland that very, very kindly have agreed to look after the plants. But already for those two plants that just mentioned, Nepenthes clipiata and Nepenthes rigidifolia, there's more plants in both of those collections than, than in the wild or probably, well, certainly anywhere else in the world. So we're trying to slowly build it up and expand it and expand it. Again, it's not easy, it, it's difficult, and it's very small at the moment. But anyway, if you're interested in what, looking and, and finding out more, it's arcoflife.net, A-R-K, arc as in arc of a ship, arcoflife.net, if you want to, want to see it.
That was part one of Stuart McPherson talking about his career as a naturalist, writer and filmmaker. Listen next week for part two. A big thank you to Andrew from Melbourne for his monthly donation. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, standing ovations, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the community radio network, including 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MBR in Nambucca Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation Science 360 internet radio station, and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. <laughs>